Welcome back to Superheroes of Science. Joining us today, we have Andrew Flax. Andrew is an assistant professor of anthropology at Purdue University. I am, uh, so I'm a cultural anthropologist, like I was saying, and I, I specifically study food and agriculture, and I've done a lot of my work um, right here. You're looking at my morning view from uh, research that I do in South India, looking out from the rooftop of a school onto a beautiful farm field here. Um, now, we were talking a little bit earlier about this idea of natural and how humans fit into that, and especially how humans trouble this idea that there is naturalness all around us. Um, this is, a, uh, you know, I don't want to brag I took this photo, uh, but this is like a pretty photo, right? This is a nice, nice image of, uh, of a landscape there in South India where I was, I was looking at agricultural technologies, especially organic agriculture and genetically modified crops and how people use those in their daily lives. Um, Sarah, Steve, what do, you, what do you see here when you look out? Well, I see water. Okay, we've got, we've got some water. Uh, it looks like a, a mountain or maybe a hill. Uh-huh. And um, some palm trees. Okay. Yeah, and mountain trees like we have here. Palm trees like you have here in Indiana? I said not like the one, not like no, palm trees. Not, yeah. <laughs> if you're lucky, um, you might have one in a pot here. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so we're, we're seeing um, plant life. We're seeing <laughs> geologic life like these mountains. Uh, you're here in the Deccan Plateau in South India in, in a state called Telangana. You're looking at this red clay soil that's kind of been eroded away from these harder granite rocks that gives relatively flat land with these fun granite mountains or hills in the middle of it. Um, we're seeing some water, so a, a catchment here with the divots uh, that catch rainwater from these monsoons. It's really important. Um, climate system, this uh, water system that goes in to uh, feed a lot of people in South Asia and also Southeast Asia. Uh, we're seeing some plant life, like the palms here. And all of that's true. And what we're kind of missing from this story is that human side of things, because there's a tremendous amount of labor in this picture, even if we're, we're not confronted with it immediately because we're looking at trees by the side of a road. Those trees are all maintained and planted there. That's actually a palm wine tree, that, that tall palm that you see there. So every morning someone will climb up that skinny uh, trunk of that palm tree and attach a pot there. Sap will flow into that pot and over the course of the day it'll ferment and it will become mildly intox uh, intoxicating. It's about the strength of like a, like a Budweiser or a a, uh, a PBR that you would have there. It's like a light beer. Uh, and that's a fun thing to do after a, after a hard day of working in the field as everybody gathers around and drinks some palm wine. But those are maintained and owned and, and managed there. You're looking at uh, in the back, this kind of pond area. That's not a natural system. That's actually a tank, a water catchment system that's been in essentially continuous use for in some cases, almost a thousand years. These were built during the Kakatiya dynasty in you South India, a kingdom of Rishi, a that Rishi in land here. So you can look at that, uh, at that hill, at that uh -huh. mountain that's in the background, and just in front of that looks like a big waterscape. Yeah, I see what looks like a, a big lake. That's right, it's a big lake, and that lake was carved out by human labor a thousand years ago, exactly for the purpose that it's being used here. A thousand to 800. It's a human-made lake. It's a big catchment system to catch these monsoon rains and store them for future purposes, for the benefit of this larger agrarian society. Uh, and it's still working today. You can see that it's feeding the rice terraces, uh, the rice paddies that you can see at the, at the very front of this, all shaped by people, shaped new every year. And for all of this, there's an ecological consequence because we're creating this beautiful lake habitat. Birds are coming in, reptiles, mammals come in. Um, a thousand years ago, there were probably tigers in this area, although not anymore. We've got food and water for cattle. We've got food and water for people who might do a little bit of hunting of waterfowl in and around this area. 
We've got biodiversity that always happens at these fringe areas where you can have a lot of life, like that fringe between a meadow or an agricultural space or a mountain and this lakefront here. But we've also got social stories. That dynasty a thousand years ago mobilized a lot of people and it paid them, but it was also a bit of like government work. And so it was mobilizing people to build these, these big earthworks that they wouldn't have built otherwise. Uh, collective action. We've got a different form of collective action at the front of this picture here. These are own spaces and these terraces mark off where my land stops and your land begins. And those are economic and political relationships that are negotiated every season. These are things that you have to keep up. If I flood my paddy and you're down river, you're getting flooded too. So there's a lot of negotiation that has to happen to make this system work. A tremendous web of social relationships that goes to make all of this possible. We've got relationships between people and markets because this is rice that maybe you saved it from the end of last year. This is a, a rice that you're keeping going. Maybe this is rice that you're trying new this year, a new agricultural technology that you're curious to see if it might give you a better yield or a better profit. Or maybe you're not so concerned about that stuff and it might taste better or it might be more resistant to an insect pest that you're really worried about. All these kinds of calculations that people do here in this agricultural space, all of it, you know, unnatural in a sense. These are all social stories and yet they create the kinds of landscapes that you see right here in front of us. Wow. Yeah, that's just amazing. I mean, to think that it's, it, this is, and this has been sustained for like the last 50 generations. Yeah. And that's just, it, I mean, which makes it seem like completely natural and not man-made at all when it's that old. But to think that, well, first of all, I think, where'd they get the bulldozers a thousand years ago? Uh, <laughs> Mercy, that, that wow, that's an impressive amount of work. No bulldozers, but an awful lot of bulls. Um, the, the rice terraces that you see below there are still today, they might be churned up by a tractor, they might be plowed and leveled by a tractor, uh, but it might be more efficient in some cases, especially if it's a relatively small area of land, might be more efficient to have some bulls do this work for you. Um, and bulls have this additional benefit that when they poop, you've got more fertile soil. You can control them a little bit better. You don't have to uh, shell out a whole lot of big investment costs. That's a huge sunk cost for a lot of people who are trying to be new farmers, say, in the United States. Just the investment cost of buying a half million dollar combine or going into that kind of debt, that makes it a very different kind of operation than what you see here. When we talk about, say, sustainable agriculture, all of that's in the mix. I mean, this has been going strong for a thousand years. I'd say that's pretty sustainable. People have been growing rice in this part of the world in a pretty similar way to this for about 6,000 years. That's pretty sustainable. <laughs> There's a lot that we can learn from this. And it, it, it doesn't always push us towards this new technology is better just because it's new or just because it's more productive. There's a lot of factors that go into this kind of thing. And that's why for an anthropologist, it's so exciting because it's important that we're keeping our, our rice is going strong. It's important that we can have these organizations and village meetings to really hash out when the water is going to go. It's important that I really like my cows and cows are socially meaningful, whether they have some religious importance attached to them, whether, you know, this cow was a gift for my wedding and I, I really want to keep it going. Um, these are all the kinds of things, social work that goes into making this natural possible. You know, we can look at it from this perspective. There's a lot of labor that it takes to make nature possible here in this picture. Well, that's kind of mind blowing. I know. We can look at it. Um, it might be easier for us to see this because this is an agricultural landscape and we might be a little bit more used to seeing uh, the labor that's there. What about a landscape like this, oh my. Uh, which looks really pretty? So I do, um, I work in South India and I work in the United States and I also do some work in Southeastern Europe, uh, looking at people who are dealing with climate change in the wake of some uh, political and social upheaval, uh, especially in the former Yugoslavia in Bosnia. This is a picture that's actually from uh, France, but it's a good illustration of this larger topic 
of, you know, where the nature comes from. Think of the stories that are bubbling beneath the surface here. We've got the beautiful meadow in the front. We've got some tree lines, some dotted houses, uh, a beautiful natural landscape, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the labor that went into making all of this nature possible? We've got hills that are unforested because there's herds of horses and sheep that go ahead and graze them. We've got lines of trees that are planted by generations of shepherds to say, this is where my land starts and yours stops. We've got little shrubs, say wild strawberry patches or the odd apple tree, not there by chance, but maintained by generations of, you know, bored, hungry teenage shepherds who are up there and they get a little hungry and you want to keep that patch of strawberry going for next season, or you want to keep that apple tree healthy for the next season. On a long enough time scale, we're shaping plants and soils and landscapes all around us all the time. And really, we inherit landscapes that have been shaped by other communities. And if we can wrap our heads around that, then it's, pretty, it's a pretty logical step to say that what we're doing right now, even if we don't think about it this way, is shaping landscapes and shaping possibilities for people who are going to come after us. So I live in like you know, a suburb in Indiana. I live in Lafayette, uh, Indiana, um, up on the hill there. I can walk to downtown. Um, I don't really think about it so much as like a natural space all the time, uh, but I've got lawn and my neighbors have lawns and there are streets and I live in a house and I might not think of myself as every day, you know, contributing to a waterway or contributing to the long-term ecological health of my area. And that might be a bit of a problem because whether I think about it or not, I am because I'm part of this system. You know, if this were all natural here in Indiana, I'd be living in a tall grass prairie. If I were really lucky, I might be able to pet the occasional bison who's walking by part of this, these herds that would have lived here a um, thousand or two or 3000 years ago would have been part of this tall grass prairie ecosystem that stretched from the Rocky mountains all the way out to here where we met up with, with forests. Um, within about 200 years, US settlers transformed the state that was about 90% forest and 10% prairie to one that's around 25% forest today. 60% or so of our land is farmland now. That's a huge transformation in a really rapid period of time when we think about geologic time and the kinds of landscapes that you see here. If we get caught up not realizing that these everyday actions have an impact on the earth and that we inherit those that came before us, then we might not be able to even imagine that we've got a responsibility going forward, let alone how to take the best steps to create, you know, the most good for the most people, if that's something that we're invested in. And just, even if we, you know, separate ourselves maybe from uh, always thinking about this move towards a, a better future, which is hard, because sometimes we're just trying to get through the day, especially in these coronavirus times. I mean, look at, look at this landscape here. Uh, this is something that through small everyday acts does a lot of good for a lot of people because people are intimately part of these ecosystems. It really wouldn't take that much for us to recognize that. And in fact, it takes a, a bit of social work to separate us from that daily ecosystem effect that we have in the sense that a lot of us might not have the time or space to go out and be part of our local environments and shape them going forward. Uh, and that's got some consequences that we'd want to deal with. Wow. Uh, are you able to look at a landscape anymore without seeing all the, uh, how, the hows and whos might have created that? Because I, I think of the, some of the soil classes that I've taken and stuff, and especially when you talk around here, yes, the transition point between the prairies and woodland happened right here where we are in, in, in Indiana. And so it's, a, you know, I think, okay, it's definitely not like it used to be. But I never thought about that until I took the classes to learn studying the soils to understand what was there before. And so is it possible for someone like yourself to look at any landscape without seeing all the aspects that are human made. The beauty of it, Stephen, is that now I don't want to. 
what's the fun in that? <laughs> there's a lot, there's a, a lot of pleasure in learning how to read the landscape in these ways. Cause you can see these patterns of people that, that came before you or these patterns of, of human interaction. Um, and that's part of the beauty of anthropology. It's a very broad field. I mean, when you study everything from chimpanzee tool use and conservation in Senegal, like Dr. Stacey Lindshield does here to genetically modified crops planted by South Indian farmers, uh, like I do, there's a whole lot of, of things that kind of fall under that big umbrella of anthropology. And so it's, it's beautiful that we can combine something like soil science with the rich understanding of humans and their impact on the earth to really combine all that an education has to offer, all that science has to offer in telling us, hey, this is important. Pay attention to this. This is how we understand the world around us. So, I, you know, I have a whole lot of fun doing this kind of thing. Uh, it's kind of like seeing the matrix. You know, once you're there, you can't really take off those glasses. Um, but, but hopefully it's something that's uh, a lot of people take a lot of joy in. I certainly have a good time being able to look at these things and point that stuff out. It's, it, I just like the little things. I mean, it's like last, when we get you know, the last time, but like I said, I, I, afterwards I was so excited and I talked to my wife about the apple seed. You know, and how are you impacting the future around you? And how are your actions impacting that? And uh, those are things oftentimes we take for granted and we don't consider or we don't look mm -hmm. at what's happening in the future based on my actions today. But you kind of work both directions. I think you're looking at what happened in the past and what might be happening in the future. And I owe a great debt to the archaeologists and the biological anthropologists who have who've given me this kind of, of information. And again, what's fun about being a, an anthropologist as a research scientist is um, I don't have to know everything. I can be professionally uh, foolish, which is a lot of fun uh, because when you're, when you're doing anthropological work, cultural anthropology work that I do, you know, my job is to talk to people. By definition, somebody knows the answers to my questions. If, if nobody knew what was happening, if nobody had a story about the things that I'm curious about, I really can't do my work. You know, somebody knows the answers. Um, and so it's really rewarding to be able to talk to people about these important things and gather up these stories and see what the broad trends are and then collaborate with someone who might be, in my case, a plant breeder or a geneticist and say, okay, people are really invested in these things. What's happening in the seed that has some impact on, say, taste or its resistance to these insects that are causing people a lot of trouble? Talk to a soil scientist. What's happening in the soil with this cumulative effect that human beings are having? Talk to an ecologist. Look at this picture here. What, are we, what kinds of habitats are made possible? What net effects larger than any individual's actions do we really see here? Looking at the ecosystem as one big connected kind of spiraling effect of human and ecological processes over time. What are we really connecting and how does that allow us to tell this bigger story? That's really fun for me. And that's, uh, that's really rewarding. If you're doing the kind of work that I do, somebody knows the answers and they can, they can help you out and tell you. And, and really my job is just to collect that up in, in some systematic way to answer a larger question. One of the things that I've found in my work, which can be a bit of a bummer because we're looking at sometimes really big questions like climate change is just scary. And uh, I might feel a little guilty because I'm here in my house uh, and I'm emitting carbon and I'm, I've got, I'm part of this lawn landscape that is not just unnatural, but like people pray, spray poisons on it. You know, it hurts the dog down the street if it goes and runs in there. It might hurt my two-year-old kid if she rolls down the hill and gets uh, enmeshed in that poison. So it can be a bit of a bummer when you're thinking about all this, especially when we've got everything else going on with the coronavirus and we're feeling lonely. It can be, you get bummed out thinking about all of these interconnected topics. Um, but there's also a whole lot of hope and promise that's here because when you can take all these things in your head, you might start to feel not just bummed out, but a little bit responsible. You might feel like you can read the landscape in these ways that we're talking about. You might feel like these problems that we have aren't just natural states of being, but something that's got a history and a context that we can actually work on and change. Um, you want to know how to fight climate change. 
talk to someone who lives in these mountains. They know they're, they're doing it. We got to talk to them. And, and that's part of what my job is. You want to know if genetically modified crops are going to uh, feed the world or if organic agriculture is a really good option for resource poor farmers, you got to go to India and talk to them. These are people who have the answers to these questions, really important questions. Uh, and you team up with other scientists who can fit in these other parts of the puzzle. But fundamentally talking to people, that can give you a whole lot of hope mm -hmm. and a, a bit of responsibility and obligation. You begin to see these people as part of a system that you're part of too. It breaks down some of that artificial separation where I can live in my house in Indiana and say, well, I'm not really a part of the prairie. This is a way of seeing all that and being a, a bit more responsible and part of that. I love that there's a space for you to, or that there's just a space in this area in general for you to be able to speak to people and hear their stories. And, and like you said, that someone knows the answer to these questions, that, that, that this is part of it, that it's part of, you know, going out and speaking to people and listening to what they say. And I imagine probably documenting and cataloging what they have to say and then working with other scientists to compare their stories and, um, you know, and analyze things with that information. I just love that that's part of, of the process. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. You get to hear all these different perspectives from people and it's your job to kind of put them together and see where other contributions might fit in. And the beauty of that is that I can talk about these same things with people who I'm asking questions of. I can say, what do you think about this? And sometimes they say, well, that's not what's happening at all. And then we get better, we get better scientific approaches. Um, we've got, I, I was talking about how if, if humans are involved, there's probably some anthropology involved as well. We've got people uh, here at Purdue University that work really specifically on what's called user experience um, in the engineering world. I've come up with some great new engineering design. It solves a great problem. Why is it that people aren't using it? And one of my favorite examples of this is one that I'm staring at right now on a, on a computer. It's the QWERTY keyboard. Oh, yes. This uh, Q-W-E-R-T-Y keyboard. This is a keyboard that is designed to be inefficient. It's why we've got carpal tunnel. It's, it was designed to slow down typewriters so that they uh, would stop jamming when typists and administrative assistants back in the 40s and 50s uh, they would type so quickly on these efficient keyboards that the mechanisms would jam. That's not a problem for my digital keyboard here. And yet we're still left with this outdated design. Why is that? A whole lot of social reasons. It's hard to reconfigure typewriter and computer plants. We would have to completely redesign everything. None of us grew up learning how to type on these more efficient keyboard settings because People who taught us how to type were not trained on those other systems. There's a whole lot of history and context to that. And so we're surrounded by technologies that aren't just the most efficient thing possible. Sometimes, as in the case of this keyboard, they're aggressively inefficient, and yet they're everywhere. When we look at user experiences, when we try to talk to people to triangulate why something is happening, uh, that's a great opportunity to bring in anthropologists and understand how it is that people actually use some technology uh, and how that intersects with larger institutions. In the keyboard case, like schools of teaching and typing, schools of um, administrative assistance, uh, manufacturing of, of uh, raw materials for these kinds of keyboards. It's, it's, it's amazing how, because I had never thought how encompassing anthropology is. Then but then as long as you, it's, by its very definition, it has to be. It's, <laughs> yeah, I'd never put the two together. But I would like to go into one more thing. I know that it's, you, you, you have a busy schedule and I feel we've monopolized a lot of your time. But um, it, you, you mentioned that part of your research was uh, genetically modified foods, so GMO. And I, that is a very, uh, it's, I don't know. I don't know if it's a catchphrase or what it is, but I see it on packaging. Oh, non-GMO packaging, and it's. But I don't really know what you did when you said, "Oh, in India, they're you know where they're painting, testing, or using uh, GMO seeds." I thought, well, I just kind of thought that was something that you know was I don't know, it, somebody in a white lab coat was growing in a some 
building somewhere I didn't know it was actually something that was planted somewhere. And uh, so could, could you explain that just a little bit for people like me? Well, Stephen, I've got a great book that you can buy that goes in uh, and talks about this whole case as well as the India case in general. Um, so uh, the, the short answer of that is when, when I, I'm saying genetically modified organisms, what I'm talking about is a process that begins in laboratories and really takes off globally in the 1980s. Uh, and it is this laboratory microbiology based changing or um, modification of the genetic code for some specific purpose uh, that is amenable to some agricultural goal in a laboratory. And then those, that genetic material is then uh, grown into a plant and seeds come from that plant and Seeds are then crossbred as we would in normal crop breeding through the normal processes of biological reproduction, botanical reproduction. And then uh, crops that have been fertilized in this way are then tested to see if that genetic modification has really gone through all these cycles uh, and, and gone into the crops in ways that we like to see them expressed. So it's what, what when social scientists or when scientists use this term, we're really referring to this new thing that begins in laboratories in the 1980s uh, and is becoming an increasing part of uh, agricultural technologies around the world. There's lots of possibilities that, you, that one could do with this technology. Globally speaking, there's really four crops that are planted that are genetically modified. Uh, and there's really two traits that they've been genetically modified to do. Uh, one of those traits is to be resistant to a certain class of uh, herbicides. Sometimes that's glyphosate, which we might know by its trade name Roundup. Um, sometimes it's uh, a resistance to dicamba or 2,4-D, which is a different kind of herbicide. Uh, the other main thing that genetically modified crops have been genetically modified to do is to be resistant to certain kinds of pests. Uh, and that's called BT crops. BT is this uh, Bacillus thuringiensis is the soil bacterium. It produces this protein that shreds the insides of caterpillars. So that's a really good thing to have in your plant if your plant's attacked by caterpillars. The main four crops that we plant that have some combination of herbicide resistance or uh, this pest resistance are corn, maize, soybeans, cotton, and canola. Those are really the ones that are plant mustard seed. Those are really the ones that are planted on any um, large scale. The vast majority of those are planted in the United States, in uh, where we plant all four. They're planted in Brazil and Argentina, where it's a lot of soybean and a little bit of cotton and corn. Uh, and in Canada, where it's mostly canola. And then uh, a little bit in China and in, in India. And in India, where I work, the only legally plantable crop, the only approved crop, uh, this is a regulatory issue, is that cotton plant. So that's what I study there. So there's all kinds of different plants that could be modified to do all kinds of different things, really globally speaking, in any commercial number. Um, that's what they're modified to do. Now, with the rise of all kinds of packaging and regulation, especially in the 1990s and especially in the United States, this was at the same time as this genetically modified technology was really getting going. Uh, because it wasn't until 95, 96 that these herbicide resistant and pest resistant technologies were really invented and commercialized. So in and around that same time, we've got some new rules that are out there. People are a little skeptical of this. You might remember if you're of a certain age, uh, there was a big scare in the early 90s with something called mad cow disease, where the government uh, in the United Kingdom, as well as in the United States, was telling consumers Cows are safe, cows are fine, no problems, eat all the beef you want. Um, the, the health minister of the UK ate a burger on live television to reassure people. Uh, and then, oops, mad cow disease, this bovine spongiform encephalitis uh, was a concern. Uh, it was an issue that was happening in, in parts of the food chain. And with that, the public became a little bit more skeptical of their government uh, regulatory systems. Within a year, the same government was trying to convince them, oh, 
genetically modified crops are fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, and there were an awful lot of newly elected legislators who said, ah, we're a little skeptical of this. We want this to go through a different regulatory process. And so that's part of why there became a market then uh, for all kinds of packaging. Now, like I said, um, there's really four crops that are planted and those are all commercial plants. Like we don't, the soybeans and corn that we see growing around here, that's not really stuff that humans eat, um, at least in Indiana. Uh, although maybe as popcorn, because I know we, we produce a lot of popcorn here. Um, it's not really sweet corn that is the main target for this. It's feed corn, it's hybrid corn that's gonna be fed to animals. Um, same with the soybeans. Most of those actually don't even stay in the country. They often they're going over to China or at least they were before a period of tariffs that we're now dealing with um, to feed hogs there. And so these aren't things that we're directly consuming, but there's a huge marketing opportunity to say non-GMO. And we see this on all kinds of things that really aren't genetically modified. As far as your supermarket goes, the things that are likely to be genetically modified in that laboratory sense that I was just saying, like if I go to pay less or fresh time um, and I'm not buying something that's been certified organic, because then again, you can't be genetically modified. Uh, it's likely to be, any guesses? I'm guessing still non-GMO. Give me, give me a vegetable you think that is likely to be genetically modified. Oh, mercy. Uh, an apple. An apple. So apples, um, there is one trait out there, the Arctic freeze apple. It's a non-browning apple. It's been genetically modified um, to oxidize less quickly, essentially. Wow. So it, you can have those cut-ups and, they, and they'll stay white, which is cool. Um, but apples have got some cultural meaning to them, right? Because apple slices, that's really something you, you, you do to kids. That's what you give to kids. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a, I'm a parent of a young child. We parents can be a bit squeamish sometimes. So there's an awful lot more invested in making people think that apples are safe and wonderful than in solving this problem of oxidization, which really a lot of people don't get too bent out of shape about brown apples, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, no store sells this. They've been approved for sale, but no major supermarket chain has picked them up, which is tough if you're an entrepreneur making these things because it's a lot of money to genetically modify. You need the laboratory equipment. You need to uh, have outdoor horticulture areas where you can actually make these things. And so the only place you can buy Arctic freeze apples is on Amazon. So you can buy them, but you're not going to find them in a store. So what's the difference between genetic modified and like, um, it, it, like grafting? It, it, something that changes, still changes that plant, it, that's not genetically modified then? Yeah, like so that's a, that's a great question because um, if we take the, de the dictionary definitions of those words, um, let's say in the year 1979, before this was a, a commercial and legal issue, if we were talking about genetically modified, we would all probably be pretty comfortable saying that genetic modification began with like domestication because domestication is an evolutionary process. We can see in the archaeological record, clearly plants are changing. They're changing genetically. They're changing physically. Uh, and people are changing as well along with them. Perhaps the, the best example of this uh, is lactase persistence. The fact that people who domesticated cows and then lived with cows for a long time, uh, if you're part of that group, if that's part of your migration history uh, going back in time, then that's an agricultural genetic change that occurred in your ancestors because of that economic activity of agriculture. You can digest milk going in perpetuity. So thank you to whichever of my uh, ancestors did that. Um, it's a lot of people who have heritage in parts of South Asia, in parts of um, West Africa, and in parts of Northern Europe. Uh, so in my case, that's probably my uh, Northern European relatives or someone who came into contact with them and passed on that gene. Very nice. Um, so that's, that's an evolutionary change. That's a biological change that happened in the distant past. Now, when we move up to, let's say, the 19th century, we've got a different kind of expansion in crop breeding because now there's, uh, there's Gregor Mendel, the Austrian monk who's coming up with these laws of inheritance. There's Charles Darwin, who's writing about animal husbandry. Um, he's, he's a little bit more famous for another book he wrote called On the Origin of Species. Uh, but he also wrote a lot of great stuff about animal husbandry because that's pretty clear evidence of heredity of evolution. 
of these slow changes that happen because we take on genetic traits. He wouldn't have known that term in his time, but we take on traits from uh, our parents that are then passed on into us. And with selective breeding, that artificial selection that happens on farms or in plant breeding stations, then suddenly we've got this diversification. So that's another kind of modification that happens uh, in a controlled experimental field station. And that's where a lot of uh, this explosion in, in new kinds of crop varieties that, are, that were drawn from all of these domestication events all over the world. Because domestication, that evolutionary process that keeps going from 10,000 years with the earliest domesticates all the way up through contemporary farms today, we're still creating, changing, evolving these crops uh, on farm fields today. It's just that science stations are in on it too in universities and, and companies. So that really picks up in the, in the 19th century, that expansion of crop breeding. And up through 1980, that's basically how you did it. It was a long and slow process. Uh, a man named Norman Borlaug came up with a way to make it a little bit faster, doing what he called shuttle breeding. You would basically, uh, through the right climate conditions or with the right kinds of greenhouses, you could speed up the seasons. But you're still working on the scale of a, a plant's life cycle. It's got a flower, it's got a seed, and then you see what you came up with later. You select the best ones, you do it again. It takes a little bit of a while. In, 1970, in 1980, a Stanford biotechnologist um, named uh, Ananda uh, Chakrabarti, uh, he moves, he comes up with the tools to move a bit of DNA in a bacterium from one side to the other. And he says, this has never been done before. What I've done right here is I've created something new and novel. This is a novel product. Um, now, according to US patent law, to patent something, to make the technology commercializable then, to say it's not just a product of nature, it's gotta be new, and it has to be in some way distilled, refined, created, invented uh, from whatever source you're deriving it from. So I can, I can patent the design of a Louisville slugger bat, but I can't patent a chestnut tree. And I can patent aspirin, but I can't patent willow bark. Because willow bark grows, but if I distill it and, re and repackage it and come up with a new kind of design, I can patent what comes from that. So Tracker Party says he's done the same thing. The U.S. Supreme Court agrees, and suddenly there is a new market out there for this new kind of technology. And uh, agricultural scientists were very quick to pick up on this because it was a much faster way of affecting some of these changes on the scale of microbiology and on that time scale of cell division versus the time scale of a plant's entire reproductive cycle. There's a lot, I'm, I'm going over a lot of complexity in this. Uh, and like I said, buy my book, if you wanna hear the whole story, I suppose. But maybe we can talk about that on, on a future episode. Um, but that's part of the differences there. So there's a difference in time scale. There's a difference in infrastructure involved. There's a huge difference for me as a cultural anthropologist, huge difference in who owns this technology and who's in charge of it. Because if you're a farmer, you own your seeds. No questions there. But if you are a laboratory biotechnologist who works for a company, exactly who owns what becomes a little bit different. And that takes essentially that locus of control uh, off the farm field and into a biotechnology laboratory. Oh, there are consequences to that. Some of them are efficiency. Some of them are questions that we might think about really seriously with who gets to own their own stuff especially when we think about something like a seed, which is very good at reproducing itself. Well, even, even seeds though, because I, we family friends are farmers and I know some of them uh, with some of the varieties that they grow, they technically don't own those seeds. They're buying the right to plant them during a certain season. And uh, if they don't plant it all out season, it's, it has to be disposed of type of thing. And uh, they're required to sell it to certain places. And so it's, that, that's interesting. Yeah. We're getting into a world of uh, economic and political and ecological integration here. Yes. Uh, and, and how many hours do we have on the podcast? We <laughs> <laughs> well, probably not enough to talk about much more. <laughs> Andrew, we sure appreciate your time. It's always so fascinating to listen. <laughs> yeah. And we it, always have a good time. 
gets me yeah. thinking. It, it's, it's yeah. a good thing, but it always gets me thinking about my impact and what can uh, yeah. impact before me, you know, and I, I stand at, at, at that edge of the woods here last weekend and I thought, oh, this is an older part than this. Why is this newer woods? Why did it happen? What did people decide to let it grow or didn't before? And, and why is this that way? And, it's uh, you get me thinking i like that i appreciate that that's the that's the beauty of it that's what we hope everybody leaves an anthropology class with so suddenly we're seeing the world in a slightly different way we're putting ourselves into it um we can see that there's no pristine environments around us there's nothing that's just untouched nature we were always a big part of it so let's tell a more accurate story about the past let's let's build a more inclusive uh you know mission going forward if that's important to us Thank you. We really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Great to be here. Hopefully we'll, we'll see each other soon. Indeed. Thank you.